what are you doing? You've been back in Australia now for a couple of weeks. I heard you say just before we hit record that uh, you were doing a podcast with Riley or the great man Wolverine when you were still in quarantine. You're, you're out of that now, are you? So, yeah, I've been back three, a bit over three weeks. So I literally had two weeks in quarantine up in Brisbane and then um, came back to Melbourne for a week and now um, on school placement and just getting getting back on with training. So, um, yeah, it's kind of kind of nice to slowly build back up into training and get back to normal life um, after coming back from Europe. Yeah, man, it's a funny vibe. I was chatting with Rambo when he just got back from Europe himself and he was on day 13 of his 14-day lockdown over in Perth. And he's like, mate, let's talk for as long as you want to talk for because I'm so over just sitting in this room that I need something to do. <laughs> was it a little bit of that vibe going on for you? Yeah. I think I was kind of lucky because we, like, uh, me and Brett went on a Euro trip um, just before we came back. So we kind of got back to the hotel and we we're pretty tired. So I was actually sleeping a fair bit the first week. So I reckon it made it go pretty quick. And then, yeah, the second week I had to do uni assignments and stuff as well. So I kind of think I was lucky that I had a bit going on that it was only really the last couple of days where you start ticking them off and then, yeah, try and, like, hold out until you get out of the hotel. Yeah, man, because what are you? You're a few years into your teaching course now. I feel like I bumped into you at the TAN maybe two years ago and you were doing your teaching course. You must be getting close to finishing that one off, are you? Yeah, so I think I'm four subjects off finishing, so uh, just under a year left. So And then I'll be hopefully fully qualified and then have it in the, have it in the back pocket whenever I decide to, yeah conclude my running career whenever that is yeah no time soon i hope man i was um yeah i was laughing because i've been i feel like one of the one of the really hot themes with people that i talk to on here is about athletes who who choose to like balance their their professional running with their working careers and liam adams man he was a popular man because of the i don't know if you've heard the hours that he runs and works but both of them are (laughs) are pretty ridiculous and he was giving me a bit of a rundown on how he does it and i go mate like do you reckon do you reckon you'd be faster if you you didn't have to balance your professional running career with your with your work career? And he's like, nah, mate, I, I feel the opposite. And I think you said something to me a couple of years ago, that same night at the 10, because I was surprised because you just started dropping some ridiculous times. And when you said you were working, I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. But um, you were saying it's nice to, to have something on the side just to take your focus and attention away from the running. Is that sort of why you've decided just to keep it going? Or is it purely just to look after yourself for when you when you hang up the spikes? Um, yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think, um, obviously you want to have something to go to whenever your running career is finished because you kind of never know when it's going to, um, your career is going to be done. So it'll be nice having that in my back pocket for it whenever I am done. But yeah, I think it is nice having something else to focus on. I think, especially when I come back to Australia, it's kind of training can be a little bit of a grind. Um, like you kind of got to get going again and start getting ready for the next season. So I actually don't mind studying and going, going out on school placement for a couple of weeks and then. Um, kind of getting me back in a bit of routine and then I can kind of I'm not in routine then um, then to, to use the same routine for training and kind of get back to um, yeah a bit of structure in your life um, after coming home so I think yeah it's kind of is nice to have something else to focus on especially when you don't have much run it like racing on or you um, if racing isn't going good as well you've got something else you can put a little bit of energy in which is um, I think obviously helps especially um, if you need kind of that that side distraction as well, which is kind of nice. Yeah, so you're not touching your study when you're over in Europe. It's purely about racing and travelling around. Uh, so I am. So I was actually doing three subjects when I was over in Europe this year. So I was um, ticking them off, but I was lucky I didn't have to do any school placement. So it was all online. So I could kind of fit it in around races. So in big race weeks, I probably wouldn't even touch uni. And then if I'd have an off week, I'd try and catch up the week before and smash out two weeks in one week. So um, it was kind of just, yeah, jumping around and juggling it when it fit but um yeah i was lucky enough it's all online when i'm over there so i can kind of work at my own rate and kind of yeah work out when i can fit in when i can't so it doesn't really get too too much in the way yeah you're secondary teaching are you so yeah uh, i'm doing secondary physical education in english at the moment so um yeah trying to um so uh, health up to year 12 and then english up to year 10 so um they're, they're the ones i've been on school placement um trying to develop a bit of teaching in as, as well so um hopefully hopefully one day when i do get a job i'll be um ready to step straight in at day one yeah nice man are you enjoying it well, dude when i was up in ballarat that was the reason the reason which for anyone listening that's where we first met when you were when you were a little fella um and i thought i was a fast runner but we were living up in ballarat and um i think one of the things that i was up there for i was a pe and english double as well i don't know where the english component came into it because uh, 
you speak about structuring an essay, I'm the worst person you could possibly speak to. PE was the was the area that I was a little bit more comfortable in. But are you leaning towards the PE side of that, or are you a little bit more confident in the English department than I am? Um, yeah, it's kind of the same. I think yeah, they give you the option to try and pick a secondary, and I was kind of I always like PE and health, and that that was kind of my focus. And then I kind of was working out what I thought like the secondary subject to teach would give me the best chance of getting a job and I kind of thought there's not too many there's not a lot of male English teachers so I thought if I do English I didn't mind it at school I might have a better chance of getting getting a job one day so I kind of that that came into the equation when I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do um on the side of um PE and health yeah it must be such a funny reality check man because I'd love to tell you uh, we'll get into this soon. I'd love to tell you I was just happy about all the times that you were running when you were over in Europe this year, but I was also real dirty at the fact you were travelling around Europe when I was locked in my one bedroom apartment <laughs> with with my wife. But man, it must be a uh, it must be a bit of a shock to the system when you when you're travelling around and, and living the life that you probably dreamed of when you're a little fella, and then what coming back and just getting into a little bit more of that routine. But what you said the the routine something you you quite enjoy once you get, once you get back. Yeah, I think this year was kind of different. Just like especially traveling around so many countries and like um, just seeing how different countries were going with like their, how they were treating COVID. Um, especially when you're calling back to people in Melbourne and you're seeing like there was full lockdown when we were away. And it's like, it was kind of unbelievable when you would hear about what was going on compared to how it was in some of the countries <laughs> we were in, like, especially countries like Sweden and stuff. You like, you'd be lucky to even notice if there was um, and like COVID was going on. So um, that was kind of the, the weird part that you just like, it was so such a far cry from what it was back in Melbourne, but I think we're kind of we're kind of lucky that we came back at a good time where COVID was starting to they had obviously killed the numbers and were starting to open back up again. So I was kind of lucky when I came home. It was we were getting back to normal living here, and then obviously now um, things are starting to be a, a bit more normal, which is nice. Um, when you see what's happening with the rest of the world, it's kind of. It's, what's happening in Melbourne's pretty good right now, so um, yeah, that was kind of nice to come home to that situation. Yeah, man, it would have been interesting traveling around Europe because I have heard that. Like, I knew Sweden was was sort of the opposite end of the spectrum to to what we were taking in Melbourne. So, what when you were there, you you literally had no idea that there was anything going on. Everyone was just going about their daily business, and yeah, I think a lot of it was um because everywhere we went, because before we'd go to meets, you'd have to um we'd get COVID tested, a lot of tested there again, so. We had to be so cautious because if we caught it, it mean we'd have to quarantine for two weeks. You wouldn't be able to go to the races. So pretty much everywhere we were going, we'd wear masks around just nonstop, um, especially when we're going in any kind of cafe, restaurant. But in some countries, it was kind of weird because people would look at us wearing masks and think that we, we must be sick because no one else was wearing them. So um, that was kind of a bit different when especially leaving. I was here for the, uh, the first week of the 5K radius lockdown where here was dead and you had everyone was rocking the masks or whatever and then going over to there where you'd be lucky to see another person in some countries wearing a mask um yeah it was was kind of strange but yeah i think when you in the long run when you see what's going on i think maybe we're doing the right thing back here which is um kind of good news yeah it's funny how much it's just dominated world news isn't it i feel like the the listeners are surely sick of me hearing how um covid's affected everyone or i'm asking everyone how covid's affected them but it's just especially with a bloke who's running at your level now where you're trying to well, you're bloody, you're trying to train for the Olympics, which just is, is you know, on pause at the moment and trying to get your head around it. You can't really avoid it because of the fact that it's just such a big part of your, your training. It's such a big part of what's going to dictate your races and stuff like that. But what, getting back to um, to Melbourne, are you, do you take a couple of weeks just to, to lay low, obviously in quarantine, but are you are you putting your feet up, slowing down with training or are you pretty much just, um, you're just a workhorse, you just go all the way through? Um, so I'm, um... I went on a little bit of a Euro trip, so I had a bit of downtime there. And then obviously the two weeks quarantine, um, I kind of started running again. We got a treadmill towards the, the second half of the quarantine. So I started working back into some jogging. And now I've only got back to Melbourne. I've started doing some light sessions again. So um, I'm probably about 65% fitness right now. And I'll slowly start building that over the next month or two. So um, yeah, I'm kind of, it's been nice to have a bit of a break, but kind of you, you know you do at some stage you got to get back to putting in the hard yards because everyone else around the world is going to be training hard so if you're if you're not you're not going to be able to keep up so um i'm feeling pretty rested right now and kind of we'll take off this school placement over the next three weeks and then i'll um be back training like a full-time athlete which will um will be nice and hopefully i can yeah try and try and get that um full, full level fitness back 
Yeah, nice, man. You just mentioned your placement, and we were having a laugh. Well, I was giving you a hard time because uh, we originally had the podcast planned for, was it, it's Wednesday today. I think we were originally going to record on, was it Monday or, or yesterday afternoon? I can't, I can't quite remember, but you had a placement out at Dandenong. And I remember teasing you or just thinking, gee, I hope I get a chance to do the podcast with a great man's chewy because Dandenong High, I've heard some stories. But you tell me the reputation's changed and you've come back a, uh, a safe man. Yeah, I was, <laughs> as you said, I, I, was, um, I was definitely pretty nervous on day one just because uh, you hear some, some things about Dandenong being pretty rough. But yeah, I was kind of surprised when I've been there this week. I've really enjoyed it. Um, the facility is great. Um, the kids are well behaved, so, um, which is kind of nice because... I wasn't sure what it's going to be like. It's a pretty mixed group of kids there. So, um, yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. And, um, learned a few things too, which is always good. Yeah, it's good once you get to the stage that you're in with your, your teaching because you start to get a little bit more free range. I remember, dude, when I was when I was doing my teaching rounds, I don't know how you found it, but the first two years, I was like, mate, this is doing my head in because I felt like I was just trying to impress whoever was in the room with me. Like, not the year two students or the year 12 students, but the, the teachers who were looking over me. I was like, oh, just... Just tick the boxes you need to tick and make sure that these guys let you get your uni degree. But once you start getting further through it, you get that little bit more flexibility. Are you are you pretty much running the show in the classes that you've got now? Yes, especially this placement of kind of, you get a bit more, um, you take a bit more charge. So like a lot of the time, yeah, you're leading a lot of the activities, you're taking classes and the, there's just a sort of teacher around if you need help. So um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of, is a little bit nerve wracking to start with when you when you're trying to get control of the group, but I think it's like anything you slowly develop your skills and then you kind of feel pretty pretty comfortable um, taking them. So yeah, it is kind of nice having a little bit more responsibility and kind of feeling like you're adding a bit to the class rather than just going along with it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Do you do you do they know much about you? Like it'd be funny. I was thinking it's so strange because dude, I go into a school now and. Uh, for whatever reason, if my running career comes up, they'll be like, mate, that's pretty impressive some of the times that you've run. And I was laughing. The fact that you're a PE teacher, I would love to see the cross-country trials just sneak up and uh, you, without too much too much conversation, just line up at the start line without too many of these kids knowing much about you. Do they do they have any idea of the, the level of runner that you are or are you just some random bloke coming in trying to get his degree? Um. Yeah, I try and keep it under wraps. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm there to teach, so I kind of won't bring it up. But you often will run into a kid or a couple of kids that run, and they'll start saying stuff, or a teacher will fo- somehow find out from your uni or whatever that you um you run or why. Like, because I was meant to do my placement generally do it a month earlier, but I had to defer it obviously because I was overseas. So, I think maybe the uni mentioned that I, I was overseas for some reason. So. I think a few people start to notice, um, start to understand what, what you do outside um, school. But, yeah, I try and don't really talk about it too much unless unless someone asks. I might, or they're runners, I might talk to them about it. But otherwise, yeah, it stays pretty much under the wraps. <laughs> this is why you got to the level that you're at now and I never did. Because if I was in your position, the first thing I do when I go into a school, would before, before I even say my name, I would probably say my 1500 PB. And <laughs> just mentioned to him that uh, I'm kind of a big deal. So I'm so glad it's in the hands of a bloke who <laughs> doesn't have the ego of myself. But, um, mate, I've got to, I've got to chat to you a little bit because uh, obviously Europe this year was I – had, I had high hopes for you. I'm like, a, I'm like a little girl. When I look at the start list and the, the results, I get excited the night before I see yourself and Grego and Big Rambo line up at a race. And I had some – just in the back of my mind, some some high hopes for you guys this year. But just to to see some of the times that you ticked off, I just I couldn't believe it, bro. I I the day after you ran your three k, your, your seven twenty eight, I woke up and I looked at the start the the results, and I knew I knew that you were in that race, and I had you picked for a PB for sure. And I was thinking maybe seven thirty two, seven thirty three something, and I saw the winner ran seven twenty six, and I sort of just scanned down the field, and I thought, oh bloody Stewie mustn't have run. And I thought, I'll just have one more look. And I looked back through and saw the finish time. And, mate, I was, it was so embarrassing. My wife was like, you've got to calm down. Because I was doing little fist pumps. And I reckon I was more excited than you were when you ran the time. But how, how was this season for you, man? You obviously, you got the confidence to run the times that you've ran. But was it, a, like, was it a shock at all, some of the times that you put on the board this year? Um, yeah, I think with everything, you go into any season, like, you kind of not, you think you're going all right, but until you're able to put, pieces together and put races together on the European season you kind of never really actually know so I think um 
Yeah, I kind of knew I was in shape, but I was like, yeah, obviously kind of hoping that it will all come together. And then I kind of was able to knock out one or two solid races early, and I kind of was able to just get on a roll, I think. And then once once you're on a roll, you start you start your belief starts growing, you start thinking that you can um, do some good things. And yeah, I think I was, towards the end, I was just going into races thinking that I was 100% just committed to giving it everything and seeing what happens. So, um, yeah, I was kind of, I felt like at the last couple of races, I just felt I was a little bit fearless. Like I just wasn't really too worried about anyone else. And I was just out there trying to, trying to run the best race I could and then try and execute it as well. So I think, yeah, obviously it's kind of when the season's finished, you look back and I even think when we were running together as juniors and kind of thinking about some of the times that I've run now, I couldn't ever imagine getting even close to them. So I think, um, yeah, it kind of does hit you that you. It's kind of a little bit unbelievable that you've, that I'm, or I have been able to run some of the times I've run when. Yeah, I think back to the Ballarat days when, when I was still a young guy, thinking an eight, an eight fifty three k was like <laughs> unbelievably fast. So, um, yeah, I think the goalposts just change and you kind of set set different expectations and goals. And I think this year, I, yeah, I thought I was in shape, but I, yeah, I was hoping I could execute some good races. Yeah, man, I was actually going to ask you about that because it's it's one thing that's interesting. So obviously, I, I sort of, once I finished running in about 2013, I didn't have a heap to do with it. Jesse and I were overseas and um, I followed the cl- uh, like the, the races pretty closely and I was always looking at like yours and Jack Davies' progress and just trying to keep a bit of an eye on the, the guys that I was sort of cheering for from a distance just because obviously being in the same group, it's, it's just nice to see the guys sneak up. But um, it, it is interesting, man, because it wasn't that long ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago when I was in the exact same situation, running around as a 16-year-old kid and looking up to a bloke like Mottram and seeing some of the times that you put on, that he puts on the board and sort of dreaming of it, but not really ever, uh, you know, not really ever giving too much thought as to whether you would run quite that fast. So I was going to pick your brain a little bit. Yeah, it's is it a bit of a trip for you now to to look at the the time or, or, or the um, you know a section or a series of PBs that you've run now? From the perspective of you as a fourteen or fifteen year old kid, it must be a, it must be a bit of a trip. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is a um a trip in some sense. I think like I even remember going up to False Creek and I was a junior, and you see the top guys running around, and you're just like looking at them, thinking, how can humans even run this fast? Like I don't understand how <laughs> how these guys can be so so fast. Like how's it even possible? <laughs> and how can they do even do all the training they do? So I think, yeah, until. Until recently, I've, I've still felt like that. You're looking at the guys you're racing, thinking, how, how can guys do this? But, um, yeah, I think it it shows that if you're able to chip away year by year, um, you can anyone can progress. And um, hopefully, if you're able to commit to it, you can um, get some pretty good results. So I think that's kind of what I've found since, I, since those days. I kind of wasn't just a direct jump to be able to run some quick times. I think I've slowly built up pretty consistently over the years to um, slowly get a little bit better each year. And I think... Uh, that's made a big difference for me. Yeah, that's one thing I feel like a lot of a lot of the blokes from MTC, um, and I think Jen might have mentioned it as well. They they always say that that one of the um, w- one of the big talents that you have, apart from obviously your physical talent to, to be able to run these times, is just your ability to be able to string these training sessions together, not just over sort of weeks and months, but what over five, six, even seven years. I remember reading an article on Runners Tribe years ago of. Um, I think they were interviewing Ryan Gregson and they asked him, who do, who do we need to look out for? And they said, oh, he said, oh, once Stewie McSwain gets some quads on him or, or grows a little bit, he's a little bit of a danger. And is that what it's been? So it's just, it's pretty much just been rocking up day in, day out for as, as much as you can. And obviously just giving your talent the ability to work to, to what you're capable of. Yeah, I think definitely, obviously, consistency is key. Just trying to um, keep keep building on each season. I think um, you kind of got to set, Set the goal, for the goals that you're going to try and get it better each year. Um, there's no no use after every season resting on your laurels. You, you're out there to try and get better. But I think for me, is the big thing. I've been able to work out strategies and routines um, that suit me with training and how how I kind of approach the sport. Because um, I probably yeah, how I train is probably a fair bit different to a lot of people and the approach I take. And I think I've kind of individualised the way that I train. Uh, which is probably a bit different to how other people um, attack the sport. And I think I've been able to work out what works for me, what doesn't over the last few years and kind of try and do more of the things that I feel like works for me to perform well rather than um, kind of follow follow what everyone else does, even if it doesn't, if it, even if it doesn't fit what I think is going to be work for me as well. So I think um, I'm lucky me and Nick have had a good relationship um, and kind of been able to develop a good 
good strategy for me to um, kind of take into each season and trying to um, trying to improve on that each year as well. Yeah, what are a couple of the things that you you've probably learnt in the last few years that really worked for you that you weren't giving too much thought because. I reckon the, the Aussie approach to training, and I don't know if it's the same all around the world, but there's a pretty stock standard approach for most athletes um, around Australia training for distance that people just, I, I think, go along with without too much thought. Has there been some standout factors for you that you're like, all right, I'm going to cut that out and really focus on other aspects of my training? Yeah, I think like a lot of things, like I've, I generally don't, don't jog quickly. So like I do a lot of my easy runs slow. I'm just not able to handle um, smack, smacking a lot of runs fast like a lot of people can. So that's kind of a big thing for me. Um, or like little things like I have over the last couple of years, I don't think since it's our 2018, I've gone up to altitude at the start of the year um, just because it's kind of worked better for me just to stay at home um, and just kind of prepare by myself for the upcoming European season. And it's kind of helped me to peak a little bit later where the towards the end of where the, t- the European season is going to be rather than the domestic season. So like just little changes like that, um, I've kind of worked out work for me better. And I think kind of those, those approaches have helped me kind of keep improving year on year. Yeah, it is an interesting thought because I think a lot of people, and, and maybe for, for good reason, a lot of them, but a lot of people who go up to Falls Creek are super inspired about training with the, the best that, you know, Australia has got to offer in terms of distance running. Um, but even the even the blokes who were sort of 24, 25, just trying to still get that breakthrough, go up and you'll hit some really hot form. But I know that there's a little bit of a reputation up there for maybe going harder than you should. I remember, dude, I went up there for the first time when I was about 17 or 18. And I don't know, do you know a bloke called Ryan Jackson? Yeah, Jacko. Yeah, yeah. He Jacko. Was, um, I remember running with him a fair bit when I, when I was a junior up there. So Yeah, he's, well, he's, he's, a, a, he's, a, great, he's a great man. He's a great man. But I remember going up there with him, and I reckon he was doing a little bit of training with Nick at the time. And, mate, some of the runs that we were going on, I was like, I can't believe we're even trying to call this a jog. Like, I was calling it a jog while I was there for a week. But the, the truth was, like, if I was actually judging and gauging how my body felt, it was, it was pretty much a session every day of the week, which is, you know, bound to reap some rewards if you can hold on for a short, term, a short period of time. But it's an interesting approach that you take. A lot of people, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about um, you know, possibly steering clear of a place like Falls, training by yourself, and just peaking for the races that you that you really want to peak in. So, is that something that you reckon um, you know a number of athletes could consider when it comes to planning their races? Maybe don't go up and just cook yourself, but try and consider what the actual target races are and how you can build your your phase of training towards that. Yeah, I think obviously a lot of it comes down to like individualized training plans. I think you kind of got to work out what's best for you. I think. Um, sometimes if I'm in that group environment, I end up training differently to how I probably need to train. Like I know, I remember when I used to go to Falls Creek, I would end up doing a lot of easy runs way too hard. You just get caught up running in a pack or whatever, stuff like that. So I kind of, that's what I kind of enjoy being back in Melbourne and just maybe having a couple guys around me or even just training solo. You can kind of work out what you need to do and kind of, um, piece, piece together what you need to do to get better. And I think you can kind of individualize training a little bit more, but I just think for us, it's kind of, we go overseas a lot of months now that when, when I am back in Melbourne, I really enjoy being back in Melbourne and just training here. So I think we go on a lot of training camps when we're overseas. So I kind of don't mind um, staying home while I've got the chance as well. So that's a perk of being in Melbourne over, um, over the new year as well. Yeah. How do you go with monitoring it? Because I feel like it takes a certain level of confidence not to get caught into the paces that a lot of other athletes are running at. Like I know one of the things I used to struggle with was like if I was going for a run with, with say, Collis back in the day when we were up at Ballarat, who was a, a freak of a runner himself, he was one of the blokes that I used to look at and go, how is it possible to run that quick? I don't understand. But I would get so caught up. If he was doing a session which was easy for him but incredibly hard for me, I would just try and get the ego trip of, hey, look, I'm keeping up with Collis Birmingham and just smash myself probably harder than was <laughs> necessary just to try and finish the session and, and say I did it. And, and looking back, it was probably to do with a lack of confidence because I knew – he was running at a level that, that was, you know, well and truly above where I was running. Uh, it's easy to see all this in hindsight. But, um, like, if you're out doing a threshold with, with the great man Robbo at the moment and he's feeling good on that particular day, is that a session where you're running to heart rate or will you try and race it out with him a little bit? Or how do you, how do you try and decipher what you're going to do in a situation like that where some of the boys try and lay it down and, and you were just trying to have a bit more of a cruisy day? Yeah, I think it depends. If you go on pretty well, I think you you kind of feel like you're um, a little bit bulletproof. You can kind of um, keep up whatever the pace is or 
um, kind of push the pace even. But I think a lot of the time you just got to put your ego away. At the end of the day, it's only training. Um, no one really remembers training too much. Obviously, racing is the, the important one. So I think if you're tired or something's not going right, you kind of just, yeah, got to put that ego in the back pocket and kind of just do what you think is going to be best. Because um, obviously, got, if you go too hard, it's going to put you in the put you in the hurt locker for a couple of days or even a week or you might get hurt or sick and it's going to put you further back. So you kind of, yeah, got to kind of hold back sometimes to go ahead, I guess. So I think that's a big thing. You got to kind of understand your body when you are tired or something's not right and kind of make sure you don't go over the limit too much. I think you can get away with it occasionally in training, but if you're doing it too often, I think, um, yeah, you, you kind of putting yourself in the danger zone of some, some gone wrong, whether that's injury or sickness or you kind of get a little bit burnt out. So I think, um, yeah, it's kind of monitoring yourself and not, not worrying about too much what other people are doing as well. Yeah. I used to notice one thing whenever I was running well, uh, I would always have this, this deep level of confidence in the work that I was doing. Um, and when you can tie, string a couple of races together and your, your training's going well, you're recovering nicely, you sort of, you just naturally start to back yourself a little bit. You go, all right, whatever I'm doing is really working. And I can only imagine for, <laughs> for a bloke like yourself, who's now, what do you got? You got three, the three Aussie records so far. I'm, I'm Stewie, I've got my money on you for that five as well. I can't wait till you get an opportunity. But um, you're, you're looking at your, your training, you're looking at your races. There must just be a, a heap of confidence that comes with just doing the work that you're doing and then putting the results on your board. I guess it's harder to lose confidence when you're sort of in a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a hot spot like you are. Yeah, I think yeah, in in running you do need confidence. I think when you stand on the start line against good guys, you kind of got to believe you you should be on the start line. You should be you got to believe that you can compete with them. But I think um, it's like anyone you'll have any European season, even you'll have ups and downs, and you'll kind of go in and out of confidence. But I think Dan, you just got to focus on having that confidence that if you go out there and give it your best, that that's pretty much all you can do. So I think. That's kind of approach I take to most races that um, you got to have the confidence that you're willing to give it everything you've got. Um, and then if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. And you kind of, you can live with that pretty easy. So I think that's a big thing, just believing that you can go out there and um, give, yeah, give it 100%. Yeah, Stuart, the mindset's something I'm fascinated in. And I wanted to know whether it was, um, is, is that an area of your game that you're, you're sort of structured and focused on? Or does that confidence just come with continually putting the results on the board? Because... I think anyone who watched you over in Europe this year, and, and one of the things I, I was just pumped for you with was it looked like you had a just a different level of confidence in the way that you were racing. And the, the first time I saw it was, I can't remember, it might have been Monaco, but you, you were racing Ingebrigtsen and that, the little Kenyan fella, and you came around him with about 250 metres to go. And I thought, holy crap, he's actually laying it down. And it was the first time that I'd probably seen an Aussie since Mottram in a middle distance race go, all right, I can, I can take these boys. So is that is that something that comes just because you've been putting the times on the board, or have you adapted your mindset to um, just sort of complement your your racing? Yeah, I think a lot of it does come down to once you do get a few solid results on the board, you kind of start believing you should be in those kind of races, and you start believing that you compete can compete with the top guys. But I think um, a lot of it is just the mentality going in, um, not knowing what you do off the training track, if you can apply it to the racetrack you're going to be um yeah you're going to be in a good good chance in it in any kind of race you're in so i think um yeah the big thing's just that mentality building it over you gain the confidence from some solid racing and training but i think a lot of it's just going in with the belief that you can um you can do it even if you get to a race and it turns out you can't do it but being able to still go in and think you can do it is um yeah i think it's a pretty important trait especially when you're in some of the bigger races and you're racing the top guys in the world, I think if you don't if you don't truly believe you're meant to be there, I think you're going to get shown the back door pretty quick. So I think it's um yeah it's obviously pretty important to have. Yeah, I reckon it was the week before you you broke the the 1500 meter record. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you ran what looked like it um it looked like a, a more of a low key kind of meet, and the paces went out at a certain pace. It was pretty clear in my eyes that you're going for that Aussie record. And then with about 700 metres to go, actually, no, with, within about the first 300 metres, I think Steve Cram goes, um, mate, he's just going for it. Like, he's just running with a, with a certain level of fearlessness that um, it, it's just so obvious that this mindset that you, you said you'd been building over the last couple of years of putting time on the board had clicked into place. And when I saw you, I was like, mate, I haven't seen a bloke run with this much confidence in, in years. But um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of attitude that I think a lot of the guys that I've spoken to this year have have 
sort of really, really notice. So going into each race, are you taking that mental note that, all right, regardless of what happens, I'm just going to lay it down on the line as much as I can and, and what will be will be. You're not, you're not necessarily afraid of blowing up, afraid of blowing up because you're, you've just got that confidence in your ability now. Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's easy, especially in like some of the diamond league races, you get in the start line, you look around at the kind of the, the caliber of guys you're up against and think, oh, I have no chance. Like I'm lucky to be here on the start line. But I think now I'm trying to go into a lot of races, just going, going in with a set plan um, and just trying to execute my race. And then whatever happens, happens. If I get beat, I get beat. Um, I can live with that. I'll work out what I need to improve on and try and get better for the next race. So I think that's the big thing, just going in and trying to run races on my terms rather than worrying too much about the guys you're racing against. I think it's easier it's easy to get caught up in other people's races rather than just focusing on executing what the best that you can. So I think that's um, kind of a simple approach I take going into races where I'm trying to execute the best race I can rather than worry too much about what other people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Are you spending much time with these blokes you're running against outside the outside the racetrack? Like, obviously, you're spending time with the, the Aussie boys. I know you and Robbo seem like pretty good mates, and I saw you guys having a pancake date or something together after your, <laughs> after some of your big races were all done and dusted. But are you are you rubbing shoulders with the, with the Inga Britsons and, and, and these other boys you're lining up against? Yeah, I think just because you're in meet hotels um, at a lot of different meets, you kind of get to know everyone you're racing pretty well. Um, so I think there's... You, you get them well. There's a level, the guys you're racing, there's a level of respect you have for them. You know how good they are to be at that level and how, how good most of the guys you're racing are. So I think you always, when you see them around, you, you still have a lot of respect for for those guys. But yeah, there's kind of, especially a lot of the guys you, you race a lot, you kind of, you'll have meals with leading up to races. You'll, um, you'll hang out with after races even. Um, if you if you go do stuff after me. Um, so yeah, you kind of build some pretty good relationships with the, the guys you're racing, which is, kind of an added bonus being able to race in a lot of a lot of these races overseas is it a weird relationship like obviously you know when you line up on the track you want to try and tear them to pieces i used to my one of my best mates is uh is jocker and back in the day we used to run together and we were always best mates leading up to a race and on the day we could barely look at each other we were just so competitive <laughs> is it is there any of that going on or it's all pretty all pretty relaxed like it's a it's a little bit of you know fun love and, and just leave the competition to race day yeah, yeah, I think it's like, obviously on race day, everyone switches on and you kind of, you're probably not talking as much when you get in cold rooms and coming out on the track or whatever, but leading, the day's leading in and then once the race is over, it's kind of, you get, everyone gets more relaxed and everyone's kind of like getting on a lot better. So I think everyone at that level is pretty competitive. So I think race day, everyone's focused and there's not too much messing around, but outside race day, yeah, everyone seems to get on pretty well and you kind of, once the race is over, you kind of move on and everyone's got other races again ready for so you're not kind of sitting on your laurels too much whatever happens in the race yeah man yeah dude i reckon last time we caught up and tell you what this podcast has gone so much nicer already just for those of you who haven't heard it, it was a great chat with you but the fact was we ended up in a subway Where, what suburb was that uh so it was actually in secure east so we're on carlisle street in the subway so beautiful street we're just we're, we're looking for a cafe looking for a place to record and i remember thinking oh crap we we had to go in and the only option was this subway and the bloke i don't think he knew exactly what was going on um but we we pulled out a a, a big recording microphone and i was trying to get away with um the podcast but i went back and listened to it it had background music it had him rec- uh, moving chairs and tables by the end of it i thought oh i can't not post it it's the great man stewie mac but i listened back to it now and i'm like mate thank god we're on skype and don't have any bloke like that in the background trying to clean up tables <laughs> but- yeah exactly i think um <laughs> the, the funny thing was we thought like because it was a weekend we thought we we're going to get a pretty good spot to to chat but obviously it was in the uh, sunday arvo so <laughs> Every cafe was closed. I think that I think we had two options. There was only really a um I think there was a Chinese kind of <laughs> restaurant open or a subway. So I think the the only place was a realis- realistic option was the subway. But um yeah, it's definitely a, a um kind of a chat I won't forget for a while either. Though. <laughs> I remember walking back with with Maddie, the guru, who's disappeared from the podcast. I'm trying to get him back. Um, And he was like, mate, that's going to be an interesting one to listen to. He's like, I I can't believe how much background stuff was going on. And I reckon after about an hour, the bloke was clearly trying to kick us out. He was like, all right, boys, you've you've had your fair share. You've you've eaten a little bit of food. You haven't quite paid your rent. So um, uh, it's going to be a much easier job to try and edit this one. But the reason I brought that conversation up was because during that conversation, 
one of the things that tripped me out that sort of it, it sort of blew my mind even as a bloke who's been involved in the running scene for so long and i made a little thing that i put on instagram about you when you ran 331 for the first time uh you hadn't done any work that was faster than 60 seconds for for 400 i just wanted to clarify because so many people go tice i reckon you've got that story wrong and he was doing some much faster work than that so just for all my haters stewie can you clarify whether that's true? When you ran 331, were you doing insane speed work or is that just pretty much part and parcel of your distance training? Um, yeah, I don't often run much quicker than 60-second laps, I think. I'm kind of not the build that can handle doing a, a lot of high-intensity um, repetition. So, yeah, I think before I ran that 331 in Monaco last year, I think I would have maybe done one session where I would have dropped below 60-second lap pace. So... It was more the aerobic stuff um, leading in. I kind of had had a leading into that race. I kind of had a sore knee as well, so I wasn't able to do a lot of really high intensity stuff either. So that kind of held me back as well. But I think in my normal training, I won't often do a lot of really fast stuff um, purely because um, I'm kind of able to develop pretty good speed without with doing the stamina stuff, doing the hill reps, doing a lot of like the tempo stuff as well. Um, so I kind of don't need to risk it by doing a doing a lot of high intensity stuff. So yeah, I think that's kind of how, how I train it a little bit different compared to most people as well. Yeah. Are you doing a lot of work out on the hills? Uh, during off, like Especially during off-season, I'll do it at least once a week where I'll be out at Waddle Park or wherever doing some kind of hill reps, whether it's a hilly tempo or hill repeats in, in some form. Um, and I think, obviously, from hills, you develop a lot of a bit of that kind of strength you need for speed endurance as well. So I think that obviously helps a lot as well. Yeah, is it, man? Is it a weird dynamic? This is probably. I feel like you might have answered this just based on the fact that you've you've said you can't handle that real high intensity work. But with the range that you've got now, um, like I feel as a fifteen hundred meter runner, if if that was your best event and your only event, uh, you know, you could you could pretty easily tailor some of that speed work a little bit more specifically, and uh, you know, try and adapt your training specifically for that event. But when you've got such a range, is it is there any difficulty at all in in knowing how to structure? your your season like when it comes to a taper for a 1500 race and a taper for a 10k race is there much different in the way that you you approach that or it's all very very similar um yeah i think i'm lucky in the regard that i can kind of when i'm getting ready for a 10k or a 1500 i can kind of do similar approaches in training um with how how i structure my training weeks or how i kind of set up my taper weeks as well so i think i'm in that regard i'm lucky whether i'm racing a 1500 or 5k 10k i can kind of do it the same um, purely because that makes it a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about jumping in and out of different type of training structures going into different kinds of races. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of lucky in that regard. But I think in the future, if I'm going to focus on specifically one event, maybe I'll try and add maybe a little bit of adaption to focus more on on that specific event. But, yeah, at the moment, I'm kind of lucky I can kind of tick, tick the two, whether it's the 1500 to the 10K or whatever, off doing the same kind of training. So, I'm probably just going to, yeah, keep keep ticking away with what's kind of working at the moment. Yeah, beautiful, mate. mate I can't see your biceps because they're, they're tucked away nicely, but I know you've got a good set of biceps on you. Are, you. are you in the gym at the moment, like during the off-season and stuff? Is is the strength work and the, the weightlifting component an important part of your training still? Um, since since then, the European season, I haven't been back in the gym, so I haven't, haven't done too much there, um, <laughs> unfortunately. So the, the, the rig and body's not looking great at the moment, but... <laughs> We'll kind of we'll fix that up over the upcoming months, but yeah, during during season I'll make sure I'm going at least once, sometimes twice a week, just to make sure I'm more than getting the strength and stuff. It's just making sure your your Achilles, your calves, or whatever, are strong enough that you're not going to break down and get injured. So um, yeah, a lot of it's I'm, I'm obviously not not hugely muscly, so I, I'm not lifting massive weights or anything, but. I'll be doing a lot of, yeah, like the stability body weight stuff. And I think that kind of works pretty well for me as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I was um, I was talking to Gregor. I just I posted a podcast with him that we did a few months ago. Just I posted it yesterday. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that in that conversation, he was telling me he hits the gym and, you know, lifts some quite heavy weights. But I was looking at, well, heavy weights for a distance runner, that is. I just want to I just want to give that context because I know some of my mates who I go to the gym with laugh at me, and I, I think I'm still on the distance running side of the weightlifting schedule. But you look at a bloke like that, and you look at a bloke like Ali and Kipchoge, and I've seen I've seen some of Kipchoge's stuff, and I don't know how legit it is, but on on uh, YouTube it shows some of the workouts, and it almost looks more like an aerobics 
style class that he's doing. There doesn't seem to be a whole heap of barbells and dumbbells and stuff like that. It's it's more body weight kind of stuff. So are you a, are you leaning towards more of that body weight stuff, or are you just try and mix and match both of the both of those sessions in that in that one session a week that you're doing? Um, yeah, I think it's like mix and match. I think obviously some like some things I might lift a relatively decent amount for a distance run, and then other things I'll lift min- minimal amount of weight. So I think it's kind of you just individualize what works for you. I think um, there's areas that I, I obviously need to work on, and they're the areas that I kind of focus more on um, when I'm in there, and then the rest will just be maintaining, like kind of making sure you can maintain the level you're at, whether that's stability or whatever, and then kind of, yeah, work on those areas of weakness, which obviously in the gym I have quite a few I need to keep, <laughs> keep developing and getting a little bit better at. Yeah, what does um what does that gym session look like when you go in? You there for an hour or so? Um, so I'll do a lot of when I'm back home. I do a lot of them through the Victorian Institute of Sports. So I've got a gym coach in there, and I'll do. I think I'll have it's about 45, 40 to forty five minutes. Um, where we'll, it'll generally be a couple of warm up um, dynamic drills, and then probably four or five different weight activities. Whether it's um maybe weighted squats, um kind of uh maybe sled pulls one of the ones I, I do quite often um and then it kind of the last 10 minutes i might do a few core exercises like um whether it's the holds or the side holds or whatever um maybe a couple of crunches if i'm trying to get 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 a couple abs again um <laughs> but yeah it's generally pretty pretty short it'll be yeah 40 to 45 minutes in duration and i kind of feel like that's a, that's a good level. I feel like I can maintain a decent level of intensity in the gym for that long. And once I kind of go any longer, then I start getting pretty tired and I start paying for it in the next few days in training. So I think, yeah, that 40, 45 minutes is kind of a sweet spot where I'm able to back up and not feel too bad the next day and not too sore as well. Yeah. Are you doing most of that work by yourself at the VIS with your coach or have you got a couple of the other crew from, from MTC coming in with you? um it yeah it kind of depends i was um i was obviously lucky i would have for a fair few years i'd have geordie williams in there and we would train every time we went there we'd be trained together so the king um, he would lift a bit wouldn't he he's he's a little power packet he's a good lifter and he was kind of like the the coach's pet as well so (laughs) he was kind of good having him him in there because it would take a lot of heat off me he would (laughs) he would draw most of the attention and i could kind of just fly under the radar and do my do i do all my weights without anyone seeing or even the coach not keeping track of what I was doing a lot of the time. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise having him there because, yeah, he would draw the attention. I'd kind of be able to um, fly under the radar most of that session, which was nice. Yeah, mate, he's, a, he's one person I wouldn't go to the gym with just based on his pure good looks. I don't know if I told you last time we caught up, but Jesse knows no one really in the running scene. And uh, when we were up at Falls Creek a few years ago, Geordie came over and he'd grown out this luscious beard and he looked like a little pocket rocket and he had a glowing tan and, I even had a crush on him when I saw him, and he walked over to say good day because I was with Collis' brother Joel, who's a good mate of mine. And um, and as he walked away, Jesse goes, "Who was that?" And uh, I go, "Geordie Williams." She goes, "I didn't recognise him with that beard." She goes, "Mate, I reckon, I reckon he goes all right." So ever since then, I've been trying to keep him away from her eyes because he's such a gorgeous man. So I'm going to make sure that she doesn't hear that he's a really strong man in the gym as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd also make sure he doesn't hear about it as well. Just try and keep that, that ego of his in check as well. We don't, we don't his boots getting, we don't his boots getting any bigger than what they already are. <laughs> it's helped him into a few, uh, a few dip finishes, I reckon. Those little picks. Yeah, definitely. I think um, he's obviously got a huge, a uh, good sprint fin- finish from the gym. <laughs> but yeah, as I said, kind of, we try and not. Especially when I was in the gym with him, I try wouldn't wouldn't would try not pump up his tires too much because <laughs> once he once he can lift a lot more than you or there's some exercise he'd be able to lift double what I could. You would you wouldn't hear the end of it. And he'd love telling people outside the gym as well how much how much more than you he was lifting as well. Mate, I'll make sure I edit this part of the podcast out completely so it never reaches his ears. Yeah, love it. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Hey, are you still catching up with him a little bit? I haven't I had him on the podcast a, a little while ago, and mate, he's he's like you, one of the easiest blokes in the world to talk to. Just the the hour flies by, but I haven't spoke to him for a, a little while. This is the beauty about this podcast; it gives you an excuse to catch up with blokes that you sort of like. If I see you at a race, I'll try and keep out of your way because you're obviously in the zone. But when you when you put all that aside and you you don't have any race, it's a bit easy just to sit back and and pick your brain. And mate, he's a he's a fun guy to talk to. But but what's he doing these days? Where's he Where's he at? Yeah, so he's still in Melbourne, ticking away training. I think he's um yeah he's in pr- pretty good shape right now, which is um good to see. I kind of did a session with him last week and he was going well. But uh, yeah, I was lucky to have 
So kind of when COVID first hit, we kind of had to train in pairs. Um, so he was the guy I was doing most of my workouts with as well. So he was a pretty good guy to just knock around um, a couple of times a week doing sessions with as well for that for that early COVID period as well. So I was pretty lucky to have such a good a guy to, good guy to train with for those um, yeah probably those six or seven weeks before I headed overseas. Yeah, and what you got a few of the guys. I messaged I messaged Jen yesterday to say, "Hey, you're, you're surely due for a podcast." I almost couldn't message her based on the fact I was still dirty at her and, and Ryan because I saw their Instagram story and I was like, "Mate, I'm so disgusted in the fact that you're traveling around getting a glowing tan at Santorini right now, and I'm in Melbourne drinking." Actually, I can't complain about the coffee, but and you've complimented me on my tan, so I can't even say I'm not tan. But the fact that you guys are traveling around living the dream, I thought I almost can't do it. But what they're up in Sydney. The great man Geordie's back down here. Are the other boys, are Robbo on that back in town? So, yeah, most of the boys are back. So, I think, yeah, Robbo's back. Um, I think pretty much everyone's back other than Rambo's back home in Perth. And then, yeah, Jen and Grego have been in Brisbane. And then they're, um, yeah, I think they're heading down to Sydney to be with Grego's family as well. So, I think early December we'll have most of the squad back in Melbourne, which will, um, yeah, it'd be nice to have everyone back trained together. And we'll have a, we'll have a good squad back in Melbourne to knock around the sessions as well with oh, be, who's the best quality person to train with in terms of this is putting you on the spot Stuart. i don't want to throw you under the bus um actually two questions best who's the best person in the group to train with and who's the best person in the group to travel with i remember i asked rambo when i first met him i go mate who's the worst person poor bugger i put him on the spot so hard that uh <laughs> i think he was a little bit in shock but there's some good quality aussie blokes to to travel around with yeah, I think I, I won't name anyone specifically, but I think the three guys I probably like trained and racing with the most would have to be Rambo, Geordie, and Brett. They're probably the three guys I I enjoy the most. But I think there's ten guys. You add in guys like Jack Rayner, uh, Paul Robertson, an Irish guy. I think we've um yeah we've got a pretty awesome group of guys that we to um, not only train with in Australia, but um, most seasons we get overseas and get to knock around as well. So. I think we're lucky that we have so many good guys in in the same group. Mate, I don't know Paul, but I've heard a few good stories about him. So he's just he's super good quality. Is he? Is he the bloke who's who's still working on his tan a little bit? Uh, is he quite? Is yeah, he quite right. white? Is it that bloke, or is that Andy Andy Vernon? I might be thinking of. That's, yeah, that's definitely Andy Vernon. He's a ghost. <laughs> Paul's actually um, Paul for an Irish guy. has probably got got one of the best tans going around. Not many of the Irish guys we train with. Um, very good tans at all. They're all really pasty white, but Paul's actually not too bad. And I think he, yeah, he kind of lets the other Irish guys know that he's he's a bit more tan than the rest of them as well. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Dude, what's the uh, what's the go with with the Olympics next year? Do you reckon? Are you getting any insider information on on what might be the uh, what might be the go? Because I've heard, you know, a few a few little conversations that it might be, you know, just get it underway without an audience there and just have the races. Um, yeah, what's what's the what's the go? Yeah, I think like anyone, you kind of um, you kind of just sitting and waiting and see what happens. Yeah. Um, but I think what what I've been hearing is it's pretty likely it will go ahead, but it's just working out whether they'll have it as a hub where they won't have any audiences like a lot of the major sports around the world have been. Or fingers crossed, um, we get everything together and they they'll have crowds. So I think I, I think it's pretty likely that it will go ahead, but it's just kind of working out the smaller details whether they'll be crowd or no crowd or whether we'll have to be be in the hub or what it, whether there'll be a hub or not and whether we'll have to be in it. I think they're, it's like anyone. We're still trying to work out what's going on with the smaller details, but I'm hopeful and I think it's um, it's a good chance that hopefully we'll go ahead ne- um, towards the middle of next year. Yeah, that'd be nice. It'd be good to good to get underway. Um, <clears throat> it's almost a, I'm not, not necessarily a blessing in disguise, but it's given you a chance just to, to have a real good blowout. It's funny, I reckon, when there's no major championships and you can just go out and really just lay it on the line. I don't know if that's a, a release in pressure for you, but I feel like there's a lot of athletes who, when there's no major champs going on, they seem just to be able to come out and just whack out some real big times. Yeah, I think it was, um, in some sense, it was a little bit of a blessing that um, it kind of gave gave me a practice to work out what I needed to do to make sure I was peaking in August. So I've kind of got a little a bit of a blueprint from this year, what I think is going to work to make sure that it, when the Olympics do come around, hopefully next August, it's um, I'm going to have be able to be peaking at the right time and kind of make sure I'm going to be 100% ready to hopefully give it a good shake. So I think, um, yeah, obviously it's disappointing it didn't happen. I think when you're running well and you're in, you're in good shape, you kind of you hope it goes ahead. But I think, um, yeah, if if I can 
do everything right. There's no reason I can't be just as good. Hopefully, even better if um for next year. So I think, yeah, it's kind of kind of gave me a bit of a trial of what I need to do, um, and a realization that if I want to do what I want to do next year in Tokyo, I've still got got a long way to go to get a bit better as well. So I think it's kind of um yeah, it's kind of a little bit motivating as well that you, you can still see that you do need to get better if you want to um kind of reach the the heights that you're kind of aiming for. Yeah, mate, I'd love to see you guys get back out to the tan and, and have another crack at that because that was, that was such a cool event. I, I know that was one of the highlights, I reckon, of the Australian athletic scene from, from my perspective was just seeing such a – it was really weird. Like, it was such a low-key event, but then seeing you blokes all rocking up with your, with your Nike kits – and Dave McNeil told me it was just a, you know, it was just quite a small event. And I got there, I couldn't believe the size of the crowd that was there. I was so impressed. Um, yeah, of course, well and truly spaced out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. there was, um, mate, there was some quality times that were, were thrown out there. Uh, is that something that you're keen to do? Because I've seen you, they've, they've just updated the TAN uh, record or the TAN top 10. And I've seen your name well and truly uh, in the top five of that, just behind Mottram. And Mate, yeah, but you're knocking on the door of that time. So is that something you'd be interested in getting as a, as a Melbourne boy or as a Victorian? Yeah. Actually, what is King Island class at? That's not... Uh, it's Tassie. That's Tassie, yeah. I've claimed Sorry. as a Melbourne boy, but... <laughs> I, still, I still claim that I, um, I still am Tasmanian. That's what I go to. But obviously, if you've lived and trained in Melbourne at all, you kind of realise that Tan's kind of the mecca for running here. So, yeah, I'd love to, um, love to have another crack at it. I think um, that was a pretty fun event. Obviously... I, I kind of wasn't in great shape when we did it early in the year. I was kind of still in base training, um, trying to work out because um, we're still up in the air where the European season was going to happen. So um, I kind of hadn't hadn't hit full full gears yet. Um, so that's why I kind of want to do it again because I think obviously there's a lot of room for improvement if I can do one when I'm in good shape and then try and knock out a fast lap. But um, yeah, it was awesome fun. I think I didn't really enjoy it the last K. Um, I blew up pretty bad. I probably went out a bit hard, but <laughs> Um, yeah, it's such a nice place to run. I think um, if you if you live in Melbourne and you run, it's yeah, as I said, it's the mecca. So you obviously want to knock out a, a quick lap there because you do get asked a lot how how quick you can run around there. So true, it's so true. I don't want anyone running too much faster because I don't reckon my time's in the top hundred anymore. I'm not even <laughs> going to talk to you about what that time is, Stewie. But mate, we, I told you about now. We've been going 56 minutes now, so I won't take up too much of your night. But dude, always always good to to catch up and, and touch base and. Uh, mate, anytime you, anytime you want to just jump on, have a, have a little chat, just shoot me a text because it's, uh, it's super enjoyable. I know the audience love having you.